I'm like the astral projection person. Yeah, like, cool. yeah. 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 I mean, it got rejected. Reject and resubmit. Uh, reject and resubmit. I've never heard of that. I, I think you were the only person in the history. No, I talked to others. So I talked to David at the time, and he said they did it at um, sociology placement. They're like, if we think the idea is good, but they didn't carry it off. Sure. That's awesome, actually. But, uh, you know, I, I talked to my chair that and this is like my first semester as an assistant. Yeah. And like, my chair is like, well, you know, it's a big risk to send it back there. Journal. No, no, it's my first year. Oh, it's your first year. You're yeah. doing that right Yeah. You like, have an invitation to read the but he told me, he told me, you're going to need publication costs. Oh, in the house in the department. Oh, it's a baby. 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 Oh, um, HAS rejected my Wikipedia uh, article, and that was fine. And they reviewed it. They didn't desk reject it, which I thought they actually would. <laughs> and it was before I had like, more quantitative data. So I get it. But I think the reason the are good at being in society, I'm like, women are twice as likely to be in the same group. So it's like, oh, you're working on something? Flag is not helpful. So, when I got the I was and you know what I mean? were, uh, I am like, like, she was like, I didn't understand your She was like, these reviews are really not I don't think they She was like, 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 she yeah. She was like, the whole waste of time dealing with her. Yeah, that's what I was going to say. She was like, 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 Yeah. 
Thank you all for coming to this event today. Uh, Dr. Francesca Tripodi is a sociologist and media scholar whose research examines the relationship between social media, political partisanship, and democratic participation, revealing how Google and Wikipedia are manipulated for She is an assistant professor at the U.S. School of Information and Library Science, senior faculty researcher with the Center for Information, Technology, and Public Life at the University of North Carolina at Chapel Hill, and an affiliate at the Data and Society Research Institute. She holds a PhD in MA in Sociology from the University of Virginia, as well as an MA in Communication, Culture, and Technology from Georgetown. Before coming to Carolina, she was an assistant professor of sociology at James Madison. In 2019, Dr. McCoy testified in the Senate Judiciary Committee on her research explaining how search processes are gained to maximize exposure and drive ideological theories. This research is the basis of her book, the other of which is <laughs> she also studied patterns of gender inequality on Wikipedia, shedding light on how knowledge is contested in the 20th century. Her work has been covered by a number of national and international outlets, including the Washington Post, the New York Times, Worker, Columbia Journal, Original View, Wire. So when uh, I was invited to help launch this very exciting book is game changing uh, look at the right to use of information as a path to political support. I think the book reframed public debates on information, showing it as a tool that can bind people together through a shared set of goals. And I think uh, Dr. Tripoli shows the synergistic relationship between right-wing media and online conspiracy, which work to amplify them. Uh, unfortunately, this book came out at precisely the right time, and it was disinformation designed to undermine trust and spoke to racism threatens our democracy. Uh, so, thank Dr. Kapoor for going to talk to us for about 30 minutes and then we'll have some time for a discussion. I have a pretty formal-ish talk, but I'm also open to any questions as I'm talking and then obviously I'll save a lot of time for Q&A as well. Uh, but thank you everyone for being here. It's really nerve-wracking actually to give a talk in front of people you know. Um, <laughs> it's way more fun to give talks in front of people that have no idea what you do. So thank you for making the time to speak today. On January 6th, we bore witness to what happens when political leaders are denying free and fair elections. What we saw was supporters doing their own research on what they believed to be a stolen election. And in my book, I take care to explain how the acts of violence we witnessed that day are not isolated events of disinformation, but actually build and are, are inextricably tied to whiteness in the United States. And today what I wanna do is work my way back. I'm gonna start with the end and then finish out where I began to demonstrate how key words and main ideas that were used to galvanize supporters on January 6th were also an integral part of the white supremacist rally that took place on August 12th in Charlottesville, Virginia. Um, but before I get into my findings, I'll give you a brief uh, overview of what I did and how I got there. Uh, I effectively combined ethnographic interviews with content analysis and media immersion. So for ethnography, I embedded myself inside two Republicans groups a women's group and a college group. And I went to 
essentially every event they had. So this included uh, weekly meetings, bi-weekly meetings, backyard barbecues, fundraising events, uh, church groups. And I spent a lot of time doing firsthand observations with them, as well as firsthand observations of three white supremacist rallies that were not associated with these events. So this was firsthand observations of what happened on August 12th, as well as two prior events. I combined this with interviews um, with 30 individuals, 14 men and 16 women. And after my respondents identified what kinds of news and information that they relied on to make their decisions, I engaged in this process of media immersion. So as part of the informed consent process, I followed people on Facebook, and then I tracked what kinds of news and information they shared over the next year. And then for um, roughly four and a half months, I got all of my news and information from their news sources. So I became immersed in their podcasts, uh, news broadcasts, written, written news. And I purposely avoided watching any news or information that might counter the information that was coming out in their content. And finally, I did a, a more thematic content analysis of the information that I was, that I was looking at. So I, uh, did a content analysis of the, of the information. And then I also worked with a data scientist who scraped, uh, who scraped hundreds of thousands of keywords on YouTube channels. So through data triangulation, I peel back the layers of conservative media manipulation machine to reveal why and how conservative elites are so effective at exploiting their constituent worldviews. And the seven tactics that I describe in my book um, start with one of knowing your audience. So those who produce media understand what are the key things that galvanate their voters, and they filter the news around them. Step two, they bridge together a very intricate media ecosystem that combines online information with legacy news. Three, they realize that groups interact and engage with information in different ways. They understand how information flows, and they strategically signal content around this information to their voters. Then they partner with rising influencers on various apps. So at the time, this was looking at YouTube, but we see this happening right now with TikTok. And they make decades-old disinformation seem fresh and new and exciting. And finally, they encourage their audiences to distrust the messenger and engage in what I refer to as the IKEA effect of misinformation. So don't worry, I'm going to get through all seven. <laughs> if you missed this slide, I'll get through. <laughs> there it is. <laughs> so in step, oh, there it is. <laughs> so step one, uh, I talk about what it means to be conservative, and knowing your audience is extremely important when it comes to spreading. Uh, propaganda, because the goal of propaganda is to unite nations, brands, and identity into a common conversation, the goal of, in, of instigating um, action, in this case, voting. So what I found is that what it meant to be conservative centers around a core set of values. And I think this quote from one of my respondents really sums it up nicely, that being conservative really goes back down to morals, it's about faith, family, the Constitution, and national security. So I did a thematic analysis of my interviews, and I identified what I refer to in my book as the five F's of conservatism. Faith being support for religious liberty and for laws that protect Christian places of worship and ideas. We can get more into that in Q&A, but it's explicitly Christian. Family, a devotion to maintaining heterosexual marriage, traditional gender roles, and identification mechanisms in criminalizing abortion. Firearms talked about the protection and celebration of the right to bear arms. The armed forces as a reverent support for both the military and the police force. And a free market is a dedication to limited government oversight to economy and corporations, the belief that consumers should regulate the market. So politicians are acutely aware of these concerns, and they become an integral part of their election platform. Pundits and media influencers lure in audiences by filtering news and information through the five apps. And effectively what they're doing is what strategist David Lane 
referred to as increasing the political strength of the Christian right. His word, political success is about addition and multiplication, not about division and destruction. Now, they also rely on a really robust network, and a lot of really great research has already come out on this. Um, scholars at the Berkman Klein Center for Internet and Society effectively mapped uh, this ecosystem back in 2016 by looking at discourse of nearly 4 million messages throughout news media. Uh, but what I do in my book is explain how this network infrastructure is more than just online information, but it's actually heavily tied to news and information that happens on the ground and deeply connected to the demise of local journalism. So as local journalism faded, uh, radio broadcasts filled that vacuum, and then through <clears throat> regulatory mechanisms, effectively Christian broadcast programming be became equivalent to um, to informative newscasts. And so you see this rise of this very deep infrastructure that dates back hundreds of decades. Now, through media immersion and content analysis of key players inside this network, I identified two central themes that I want to tie in today. The first is that the left is dangerous, and the second, that media is biased. Now, the idea of media bias is, I'm sure, not very new for anybody in this room. Um, it's a ground uh, cornerstone of uh, conservative propaganda dating back decades and decades. Um, but this idea of the left or the dangerous left is an important part of this campaign, and I'll explain how that all gets through together. So to support these arguments, conservative elites engage with their voters by understanding how they interact media literacy. And I refer to this process as scriptural inference. So this is a compare and contrast method on focusing on the word of documents and prioritizing this direct analysis of primary sources over um, oral interpretations of the text. And there's been a lot of great work that looks at the difference between how those on the right and the left um, conceptualize the Bible. And I'd love to talk about that more in Q&A as well. Um, so what I describe in my study is how this, this plays out. And I think my favorite form of this is doing ethnographic observations inside of a Bible study. And I was sitting in this Bible study, and we were talking about effectively three lines of biblical text. And we were really digging in and identifying how these lines of biblical text uh, related to our own time. And then the person who was leading this, this Bible study took out a copy of the new tax reform bill, and he was like, now listen, I want you all to go home tonight and read a copy of this bill. I want you to apply the same close reading that we just did with the Bible to better understand how these tax changes are going to influence our community. And he said that we have to do this for two reasons. One, we really can't trust the way the news is going to depict this tax change. And these tax changes are going to have extremely different effects for the local farmer as it might for the local business. So he was evoking this idea of a free market and just telling us that we had to transfer this very close biblical reading to fairly high level legal text. So as my study reveals, this process of scriptural inference is not bound to scripture or really a belief in God at all. Um, and these findings match other sociological accounts of conservative groups who found that members did not necessarily attend church gatherings, but they were happy to practice in uh, conservative Christian beliefs. So this included, in addition to saying the Pledge of Allegiance, a prayer is always at the start of every meeting that I attended. And they also describe this practice whereby conservatives engage in documents that they deem sacred. So this includes like the Constitution or the Federalist Papers or the redacted memo that Trump released when he was undergoing his first impeachment. How does this actually play out in real life, though, I think is important. So I think the most credible example that I saw is this idea of the wall of separation. Now, many of us have this idea of wall of separation from um, how we learned it in school, which is effectively, there's this wall of separation that should separate church from the government. But using scriptural inference and drawing on the Jefferson letter that he wrote to the Banbury Baptist, 
Sanbury Baptist. <laughs> they show, <laughs> yeah, that was a lot, that they show that um, by looking very closely at this original letter, that what Jefferson and the founding fathers meant was that the government should be highly influenced by a Christian belief in God, and that this protection of church and state was about protecting the church from the government and not the other way around. So they draw on these media literacy practices in order to support their argument. And as my study reveals, um, this is then a problem with <laughs> the way we look for information online. So I talk about this a lot in my book, and I'm going to give us a very apolitical example, because I think it's more fun to mix it up a little bit. Um, but what I don't think many of us understand is that the way we see the world and the way we believe things heavily influence our starting point, or what we refer to in information science as our keywords, which map on these concepts of relevance. And what I like to start with is what I call the power of input. So a lot of us think of this notion of the sky is blue. Um, we can all think about it as Carolina blue, because we're here. Right? Um, we think of this idea of the blue sky. And what scholars have shown through um, analysis of texts like Homer's Iliad and Odyssey, or looking at Hebrew translations of the Bible, this idea of a blue sky is actually a social construction. So it means it's heavily dependent on the way others within your community view and agree upon color. And it's tied to this notion that if blue, in um, in nature is actually very rare. Uh, blue as a color is a product of synthetic production, and it traces back in Roman times to a very beautiful stone that people were able to grind down and then make blue paint. And it's why the Virgin Mary is often painted in blue because it signifies wealth, purity. And so this idea of a blue anything became effectively tied to these like products of, of, um, of us, right, of manufacturing. Now what's interesting though, is that I like to show with Google, um, you can very quickly confirm this idea, like why is the sky blue, okay? So you say, why is the sky blue? You get this great information from NASA, that talks about the scattered directions of the sky, you get beautiful color return images, you get some great um, but if you Google something like, why is the sky not blue, which is really just one simple shift in syntax, um, you get explanations that the sky is effectively a combination of the molecules in the sky, um, so pollution levels, and how the sun filters through those levels of pollution. And that's what influences what we perceive to be the color of the sky. It also uh, helps you by saying to people also ask, why is the sky not actually blue? Or what is the real color of the sky? So by effectively understanding what these inputs are and helping us find like-minded queries, queries, Google can help shape that reality. And this is true if you Googled any color of the sky, right? You could Google the sky is green, or the sky is red, or the sky is gray. And Google, because it's programmed in what's referred to as relevance, is going to try to best match those keywords as much as possible. Now, when it comes for things like the color of the sky, that's not really a threat to democracy. <laughs> so we're not super worried about that. Um, but why my research explains some things is that even though everyday people might not necessarily <laughs> understand the mechanics of search, my research demonstrates that conspiracy theorists and propagandists have a very, very clear understanding of how information is connected to world views. And they exploit these search holes, these loopholes in search to spread this information. And I believe that this is perhaps one of the most dangerous parts of my book and what I talk about in my book, because conservative pundits suggest audiences to distrust elites in favor of this individual expectation, but they also routinely and effectively curate content, optimize that content and monetize unique phrase in order to amplify and organize social movements that impact political outcomes. And this work, my research on this work, has been reported on in the Washington Post, um, 
and as well as a conversation I, an op-ed I wrote in Wired. Um, and I talked about how Representative Devin Nunez effectively used the strategy of keyword curation and strategic signaling during Trump's first impeachment hearing. This actually took place much longer after my research was over and I was driving, um, you know, driving to work. I was listening to the impeachment hearings on the radio and I heard Devin Nunez's opening remarks and he's like, we should not be talking about this today. What we need to be talking about is Nellie Orr. Now, can I quickly ask who in this room might know who Nellie Orr is? Does anyone know? I've read the book. No, <laughs> before, yeah, before reading the book. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, now you all hopefully don't have any deal. So I know how everyone voted based on this very quick text. Nellie Orr um, is effectively someone who used to work for Fusion GPS. And Fusion GPS is the same company that hired Steel, who manufactured the now disgraced Steel dossier, which some of our other researchers look at. And so because Nellie Orr was married to Bruce Orr, who was the part of the Department of Justice, he effectively <laughs> demonstrates that the impeachment was part of a well-planned coup inside the left, who was trying to take down the Democrats. And I first heard about Nellie Orr when I was doing my media immersion. And I had not heard her name since stopping that process. So I actually thought maybe I had had a small stroke while I was driving. Because I, I, I was like, did this guy just say Nellie Orr? I swear to God, am I listening to NPR? What just happened, right? And then I effectively went home and then listened to his full post post transcript. And sure enough, he was talking explicitly about Nellie Orr and, and future GPS. And so by effectively processing this key term, if you looked at YouTube or Google throughout the entire impeachment and you searched for Nellie Orr, all you got was conservative information. It was a complete silo of conservative. So, how is this all connected? And why is this a threat to democracy in our country? Okay, let's start again with our core belief. The left is dangerous. And because the left is dangerous, it poses this threat to the 5S, and because it's so dangerous, it offers this really beautiful scapegoat when things go wrong. And this was a central idea that was pushed by Jason Kessler in the lead up to the Unite the Right rally. So despite using these platforms, and I was inside these Facebook groups where they were actively promoting this as a white supremacist rally and promoting an all-star lineup of white supremacists, they were also using this tool to claim that Antifa, which is a loose organization of anarchists, um, would pose a threat to the rally. Because they would pose this threat to the rally, they were encouraged to come armed, they were encouraged to stand their ground. Now, as the rally was unfolding, back message boards on 4chan and 8chan demonstrate how they were already trying to deflect the blame and the violence that took place on August 12th with Antifa. So you might not be able to see this um, from, from far away or online, obviously not. But what you see in here is why would a leftist try to drive their car into an Antifa rally? Um, and they were referring to it as an Antifa rally. And this very viral piece of disinformation was effectively saying the person who had run his car into protesters, killing Heller Heyer, was a defector of the left who had flown or driven here from Ohio to make Trump bad. And so as this was unfolding in chat rooms, you see this idea of, of Antifa. Then InfoWars picks this up, right? So they talk about this, um, and they start saying there's this bombshell connection between Charlottesville, Soros, that's a whole other separate talk which we could get into, and we are welcome to in Q&A, are trying to claim that Soros had paid Antifa protesters to attend the Charlottesville rally to try to make Trump look bad. And in the weeks and months that followed, numerous other articles followed suit that served to equate Black Lives Matter with Antifa and frame them as the villains in white supremacist rallies, demonstrating a concept that actually Alice Marwick, who's here, alongside Becca Lewis, a CTAP affiliate, referred to as this trading up the chain, right? So they use this horrible disinfo in these bad spaces. It gets picked up by an incendiary figure like Alex Jones, and then it just kind of 
multiplies and, and becomes even more widespread. However, the same keyword rose again to deflect blame when Trump supporters stormed our nation's capital. Um, so what I'd like to show you here is just kind of a small snippet of members of conservative elite who effectively tried to say that it was Antifa that stormed the Capitol, not Trump supporters. Um, Candace Owens tweeted that it left the dead Antifa thugs admit. Uh, Lauren Ingram, Laura Ingram repeated the same allegations, saying that there were reports that Antifa was sprinkled through the air. Uh, speaking on Lou Dobbs Fox Business Show, Representative Mo Brooks said that there were two parts to the event, equating it to fascist element, Antifa elements. And Todd Herman, when he began his episode of Rush Limbaugh's podcast, claimed that he had been monitoring Antifa back channels <laughs> and had firsthand evidence that Antifa had embedded themselves into the protesters and that they were the ones who were causing violence. The Washington Times actually published an article titled Base Recognition Identifies Extremists Storming the Capitol. And in the body of the article, that those extremists were Antifa. And Matt Gates used this article on the House floor that day uh, as evidence to claim that people who breached the Capitol were from Antifa. Representative Paul Gosser shared the news story on Twitter. Um, this tweet is still up, if you want to take a look, uh, claiming that the hallmarks of an, that what happened on January 6th were the hallmarks of an Antifa provocation. Now, even though the Washington Times actually issued a small correction, so if you go to this article, you'll see a correction. Misinformation is still widely accessible with a simple Google search. So if you looked up Washington Times Antifa evidence, you can pretty quickly walk away <laughs> with a misunderstanding of that article. Um, so you can see because the way uh, they highlight your theory within the recap, it says still this article is still the number one result, right? Saying Trump supporters say that anti cop members, the size of one of them, has infiltrated the protesters. That being said, I want to be clear that blaming Antifa and the reason behind why they were there is not some one-off example. And so thinking about this idea of a stolen election is extremely important. Um, because as my book explains, uh, people were querying this idea of a stolen election so frequently that Google was actually auto-completing SASA with SEAL in the days leading up to January 6th and directing searchers to the nearest rally at their location. So what I wanna demonstrate and what I demonstrate in my book is that disinformation flows along this well-worn path, that it's pretty predictable, and that, it's died, and that it's inextricably tied to a history of white supremacy in the United States. So this central lie, right, this stop the deal, uh, this is what Trump used to gain the trust of his supporters and get thousands of people to come to the Capitol. Among the many lies that were told on the stage that day, and this is from his transcript, Trump told his attendees that dead people had voted, non-citizens, felons, and people who had moved had voted. Tens of thousands of votes had been switched from Trump to Biden that Dominion voting machines had a 93.67% error rate, very specific lie, right? um, that secret <laughs> operatives were stuffing thousands of unsecured ballots into duffel bags that were left on park benches, that mail-in ballots had been backdated so that they could stay up count. And at one point during his Trump asserted that the presidential election of 2020 was the most corrupt election history maybe in the world. Woven into these lies was this idea, though, that his supporters had started to stop the steal. Now, some might think, well, that's kind of pretty low on the bar <laughs> of lies that he told. But, I, but understanding that this is actually a manufactured disinformation campaign is so important. So Google Trends tell us a really beautiful, far different story. 
Uh, for those of you who are unfamiliar, Google Trends is an unbiased sample of millions of queries that happen each day. The results can be reviewed by anyone at any time at trends.google.com. Effectively, they normalize data to make comparisons here. So how you create a chart is on a scale of zero to 100, something that's trending at zero means that very few, if anyone, is searching it on any given point. 100 means like maximum interest, like, oh my gosh, so many people are Googling this at the same time. And as you can see from this chart, um, Stop the Seal originated back in 2016. <laughs> Um, when Trump thought he was going to lose to Hillary Clinton. And uh, this lie actually was um, very much circulated by political strategist Roger Stone. Uh, you see it peak again in October of 2018, very coincidentally, around the election <laughs> of 2018. And then you see it peak again in the months leading up to the election. And then this is right before January. So as you can see from these chart spikes, um, maximum search interest was, was really building uh, per year. You can actually go back at, at old Twitter data. This is from 2016, these posts that were, um, that are still there from the Stop the Seal hashtag. You see that these strung together lies are actually deeply embedded parts of the disinformation ecosystem that many of us have studied. So some centered around anti-Semitism, Again, you see the surface behind George Soros, the Jewish billionaire and humanitarian that is linked um, to a lot of these paid protesters, which we could also talk about in Q&A, because it's actually um, the way that they discredited protesters from the 1960s. Uh, others relied on like other racist tropes, like legal aliens or threatening democracy. Um, some worked out of the obsession with, um, with dominion, right? So this idea that voting machines are unreliable, and one tweet even included an advertisement for a company called Trump Ballot Security, which was an email address. And I sent them an email, but I never heard back. So I don't know. <laughs> Someone, if anyone did get an email back, I'm supposed to let me know. So over four years, Stop the Seal gained momentum, and Trump used that to his advantage, encouraging people to walk down on January 6th to the Capitol. Um, but fears around a stolen election keep back. Decade. And this is actually part of the propaganda handbook, right? Make these old ideas seem like they're somehow illegal. So W.E.B. Du Bois refers explicitly to this phenomenon of misinformation in his 1935 book, Black Reconstruction in America. And as he notes, um, as Black Americans were finally granted the right to vote following the passage of the Reconstruction Act, you shortly thereafter see these lives start to circulate. Uh, all the way back to the 1800s, that African Americans had abused their voting privilege, that they had engaged in corruption, or that they stood generally unfit for democracy. The language that Trump used to stop, stop the seal in referring to election observers is a previous effort, dating back to the 1980s. So the Republican National Committee created in the 1981 the National Ballot Security Task Force. This was a group of armed off-duty police officers that had been hired to patrol um, historically black and Hispanic neighborhoods. Moreover, the falsehood that others are stealing the election is then subsequently used to justify um, what is referred to as election integrity, um, redistricting, making it more challenging to get to the polls. So when challenges to election integrity lead to violence, conservative elites rely on disinformation, encouraging their supporters to see both sides of domestic terrorism. This is a strategy that had been used for decades, equating, for example, civil rights protesters like Martin Luther King, communism, and portraying insurrectionists or Confederates as patriots. The problem is, it's sticky. It's believable. These lies are not going away, right? Um, these are kind of recent polls that, that people still think Antifa is the reason behind the violence uh, that happened on January 6th. A lot of people do not think that Trump lost. Um, and this proliferates online. And so 
These next two examples are just from very recent things. So first I'm going to show you a new story, and then I'm going to show you uh, how search engines make it really easy to connect with these social movements that are trying to um, threaten democracy. So both the Associated Press and the New York Times just in the last week or two weeks have talked about the way uh, election deniers are using Facebook to create rallies. So I read this article, and in this article, they were talking about um, election integrity forums. So I was like, oh, well, surely Google's like reading the Associated Press, and if I search Montana election reform, uh, 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 Montana election for integrity forum, I'll find something. But actually, <laughs> Um, I found their website, and I found a network that helps connect them. So then I thought, let me just go back through all 50 states. Um, and I basically did this with all 50 states to show how using these keywords that are in an Associated Press article, warning us that these forums have a danger to democracy, are really easy to find. It's you don't believe in this election. I did the same thing with the New York Times article that came out the last day. Um, in this in this search, I used effectively the exact same keyword, right? This is called voter integrity group. And the top return, I went through all the states, the top return is their Facebook group. You can connect to other like-minded Facebookers in your area. These are also run by candidates on the ballot. And these are effectively propagating the idea that the 2020 election was a stolen election. I did voter integrity groups near me just to figure out what's going on. How much do they like us? That what's going on in uh, North Carolina. There are two pretty, pretty incredible things actually happening in North Carolina. Uh, the voter integrity project, uh, which says that they're about protecting the civil rights crisis of our time. Um, but this is actually uh, talking more and more about um, election denial. So, um, how do conspiracy theorists effectively close this group and encourage their audiences to dis distrust elites in favor of their own interpretation of events? Um, I refer to this in my book as the IKEA effect of misinformation. So, business scholars have found that when people are encouraged to put together uh, their own products, they value these low quality products more than if somebody else put them together for them. And conspiracy theorists and propagandists draw on the same strategy, providing a tangible do-it-yourself quality to the disinformation process. Independently conducting a search on any given topic makes audiences feel like they're engaging in these self acts of discovery when they're actually participating in a scavenger hunt of lies. And Marjorie Taylor Greene actually described this process firsthand when she testified before Congress as uh, the House debated whether or not to remove her from two committees. Um, she explained that she was really distrusting of mainstream media, and so she turned to Google, and in her quest for truth, ended up on QAnon. Now, a lot of people ask me, how do I fix this? Like you know, yesterday, how do I fix this problem? I actually think focusing on fixes is the wrong uh, focus, right? Um, focusing on fixes make us think about it as like some sort of bug in the code. It is not, actually. I think remaining obsessed with a fix misses the root of the dynamic at play. As voters and residents, we have to continue to push back on these disinformation efforts and these efforts to just mainstream extremism. We have to start by analyzing events like January 6th as part of a larger contextual pattern. And by offering more nuance on the key words and processes that they rely on to amplify, validate, and normalize white supremacy, we can work together to break the disinformation. Because as I argue in my book, disinformation is not a bug in a code. It's a feature that's being wielded for political gain. And this is great for us. Thank you for your time.
Ethnographic encounter of um, Unite the Right crowd. And it made me think from sort of a research perspective, you know, how do you as a researcher engage with people uh, who use you might find odious, <laughs> who are doing things, I mean, you know, Heather Heyer was murdered, um, and represent them in interviews or you're doing a Bible study with folks that you might really disagree with. You respect them as you know fellow humans, but they're, they're doing things that are not good. So I wondered about that. sort of part of the research. Um, the other thing that I wondered is, I don't know if this is my bias, but this seems like maybe asymmetrical. And is it just my bias or like is the left like not doing this or not doing this effectively? And like, is there something about the technology itself that lends it to this political project that is like the left is not good at engaging with? So up and then that's your question. No, that's okay, like, I can't those, two questions, <laughs> those two questions are that natural. Um so the ethnography was was uh, challenged for this project for sure. So I would say the ethnography, the ethnography sorry, there's two parts. The ethnography of um, being embedded inside conservative groups, I don't think was particularly challenging for me. I am a white straight woman. I was raised in a Christian setting. I just didn't talk much. Um, I referenced my 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 husband's military background. I um, was thankfully uh, part of a larger research team at Data and Society where I could have discussions about like, um, I think I'm seeing something different. And I'm like, you know, so that, I think that was not, that ethnography of issues as a white, cis, like cisgender woman was pretty easy for me because I could pass very easily and I never felt threatened. Um, obviously the ethnographics that I work work that I did inside Charlottesville was really, really personal because I was sitting there at the time and I walked to these rallies and like my baby were at home. So, um, and I didn't write that section until the end because like I couldn't actually write that section. I couldn't go back to those spaces. So that was like very challenging and I almost didn't even put it in because I was like, I can't I don't know if I can look at it again. Well, it does draw the reader in. <laughs> Thank you. <Yeah. laughs> um, well, few. At least it all worked out. Um, no, I'm okay. Uh, so that was very personal in our neighborhood. And on the day of Unite the Right, I mean, white supremacists were parking in our neighborhood and like walking to this rally with flags and signs. And it was um, like very overwhelming. Uh, that was that question. Um, oh, and then also the media immersion, I would say, was completely bonkers and like definitely was really, really challenging for me to only get my news and information from um, an ecosystem that is talking about something completely different. And I had like multiple conversations with my spouse where he was like, I don't know what, I don't know what you're saying. Like, I don't, I can't, I don't know what you're saying. Um, with regards to the left, because I'm that kind of person. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> does the left like do this? And so I, I give a couple of bits in my book. So like, yes, they kind of can't. Does anyone know who this is? This is Dan Savage. He's a very prominent LGBTQ radio announcer. And he, I think, has one of the most effective examples of this, which is the Centaurum issue with Tarleton Gillespie. actually wrote about this. And, uh, research and effectively uh, Rick Santorum was running with, with the senator, and he is a very um, crass 
thank you. I'm saying about, about equating effectively uh, gay persons with pedophilia. And Dan Savage was like, um, we're going to rename uh, Sinfora. Let's rename what does Sinfora mean? And so he like activated his community of very robust radio and podcast listeners. I mean, he did the exact same thing, right? And he was like, Don't let's. Yeah, well, now, yeah, I mean, if you want to, you're welcome. <laughs> um, and then, and then he, and then he created a website, Sinforum.com, and he used his community to rename it. And then it was the top, it was the top return while he was running for re-election. So, like, it's possible, of course, the left can do it. What I say is not possible, why it's, I don't think it's equal, or why I do still think there's asymmetry, um, is they, one, they're not particularly good at it. So in, uh, I did a metadata analysis of YouTube keywords. So this really fantastic data scientist at the markup, uh, Leon Yin, he wrote this amazing script that can see how the producers had their own content. So I was able to get like a firsthand look at like how do producers conceptualize their content? How do they hope that people will engage in it? And it was like, the producers on the left just like have no idea how tags work. And their content was tagged very literally. So it'd be like, oh, this is a podcast about um, Google. So I'm going to tag it with Google. But the person, the but, but media producers on the, <coughs> on the right were like, you know, we don't like this concept of critical race theory. Let's tag all of our videos with critical race theory. And even if this video doesn't have anything to do with critical race theory or feminism, we can still be at the top of YouTube's results when people are searching for concepts on this turn. And this is why routinely when keywords are much more associated with progressive concepts like social justice, like critical race theory, like, gen like transgender rights, um, top returns on YouTube are often conservative content creators. So, you know, I think it's very important for us to recognize that Sure, they could potentially do that, but don't really do it that well. Um, and then the other thing I talk about is power, right? So actually, Jen Schrady has this really great book called The Revolution That Wasn't, where she looks systemically at systematically, excuse me, at a group on the left and the right, these grassroots groups. And she talks about, well, in order to do these things, you need money, you need time, you need the understanding of how information flows. And these aren't evenly distributed amongst these groups of activists. And so effectively, um, groups on the right are just much better resourced. And so their messages are better. Those are great questions. Hi, thanks, Daniel. The question is, as you talked about amplification and symmetry, is it the, who are the activities of this separation? So in the military, military press releases, there's two options. Your external audience, the soldiers themselves, you're already trying to insist on the kid, but you know, to build a live around and also external one. I guess my question is are these different disinformation systems changing the conversation, you know, naturally, or are they just, you know, activating the same people who probably were already kind of like you're dealing with a sample that were already pretty racist and now this is just confirming? Because then that ties in like to my next question we talk about information asymmetry, but the Republicans keep on losing the popular vote. And it's like, if they're all, if they're so powerful, if this, if this disinformation, even in Ukraine and Russia's evasion, when they convince people like outside of the in-group that these ideas are true instead of just reinforcing itself? Sure, those are good questions. So I would say, um, to make sure I'm answering them. So in terms of matching their audience or trying to get access to their audience, I feel like with, um, and this actually is in my research, this is also really great research happening at the markup, but they showed that when it comes to advertising and tagging, content creators on the right are expanding their scope of who might be interested. So they aren't just targeting people who are their listeners, they're like, who might be our listeners? And then I did a research report with Define American, um, where we looked at anti-immigration sentiment on YouTube, and we used a, a software called Tubular, which maps who else watches this content, and it 
shows you demographically, like who is this appealing to? And there are what, what it looks like, at least through these software systems, is that they understand like the intersection of interests. And so they market to people who may not be interested in this very specific thing, but who could be interested in other things. Um, I would say also, I think they engage in this element of like strategic hashtag warfare, kind of what I was talking about with Victor in the sense that like with PragerU, which is a very prominent um, conservative content creator, they have more of their videos are tagged with feminism than are tagged with conservatism. So that, I mean, I, I, and I would say, I don't think their target audience are feminists, um, <laughs> but I think their target audiences are persons who are like, what is this concept? And then with regards to the second question, which I would say like, who is their audience or is it working? I mean, I think like the moral panic around critical race theory, which is what Victor is going to talk about tomorrow, is a manufactured like, concern by political activists on the right who have like very loudly and loudly been like, this was our strategy to make you think that this is something that it's not. And so I would say their ability to um, shape the conversation in ways that is affecting school boards and affecting um, governor's races and affecting a lot of like conversations happening on the ground um, demonstrates this. Does that answer your question? Yeah. <laughs> Um, I've not read your book, just for, but I, it's on my, it's definitely on my list. Um, uh, anyway, um, I really love this concept and as somebody who's given left politics, completely agree with you. We are very bad at this and we are very literal. Um, and I don't think like that's entirely due to, I think there's a lot of reasons for that, which I'm sure you kind of don't want to do, but I guess what I'm really curious about is the kind of pipeline of these concepts to the like mainstream political rhetoric. Mm -hmm. So like what you were kind of saying with like, you know, hearing it from like Nunez and suddenly hearing these like concepts echoed or we're like kind of seeing this moment of where like campaign rhetoric on the right, like Trump obviously has recently like really leaned in and embraced like QAnon conspiracy theories. And like we're seeing, you know, like I think it was like 19 people like, candidates on the right side not including the one running in this state for Senate, like refused to accept like election results. So I guess from your kind of research or what you kind of discovered with the strategy in this book, do you think it's kind of just like a natural kind of evolution or is it more of like a strategic partnership that's kind of emerging? On the left? On the right, sorry, sorry, on the right. I was just, oh, yeah, okay. Oh, yeah, like, like, on the right, we're seeing like, you know, in politicians starting to embrace a lot of these spiritual. Oh, okay, true, true, true. okay. sure. So I would say, I think, and actually we talked about this a little bit yesterday. I think it was actually Daniel's question about this a little bit too. Um, I don't think conspiracy, okay, so like denying the results of the election and the mainstreaming of this lie, I think is um, almost a return to <laughs> the disinformation from like the 1800s, right? Because what you saw was, Reconstruction, and then you saw, um, you know, the mass um, um, burnings of like prominent black neighborhoods. And so, I mean, I think you can see like as strong as power starts to lose its stronghold, it you draw on extremist rhetoric because you don't want to lose that powerful stronghold. So I I don't think that this is necessarily. Um, you know, new in that sense. I do think, uh, and I also think that there's been a very um, strategic partnership between Pat, um, media strategists, political strategists, and politicians. And they work as this like effective bridge between one another. Uh, you know, Vice President Pence had a radio show for many years. He was called Limbaugh on Big Cap, I think, which is like, um, because he was like the less angry version. But he, so I think like understanding this, this and um, and there are like institutes that, that help, and also Frank Luntz, right? So we, I talked about this in my book. Um, 
the prominent political strategist from the 1990s, like effectively has a book called Words That Work, <laughs> where he says, if you don't like what's happening, change the conversation. And he did, like climate change was a creation by Frank Luntz to make global warming seem less scary and that the science was still out. And they said politicians running for office to take back the house and then I have to use this language. Part of I don't think it's you. Does that answer your question? I think some of the elements of like strong conspiracy, but I think it's actually much, much older. Yeah, Shannon. Okay, so I was just uh, I'm reviving on the same wavelength. I was just about to uh, bring up the climate change <laughs> uh, example um, because I want to ask a question about uh, the sociology of journalism and uh, journalists and media. So, how come is it that we often see these words on the right, which are reshaping things? Pro life is another example of this, right? Um, and all of these words. Sort of entering into the mainstream, uh, you know, news coverage. But I don't, I at least can't think of any examples of this sort of the other way. Uh, my a priori um, is that, um, like most journalists do tend to be more liberal, and uh, it's like a little bit like an overcorrection. You know what I mean? They're like very sensitive to these charges of conservative bias. But I would be really curious to hear. Like what do you think about like why is that why is it so successful you know with getting these you know the, the words that matter into the news i mean obviously like you said like in the lunch example right like if politicians are saying a lot then like you know journalists are going to end up saying it um i think we have moments where we see that's not quite true right where journalists will challenge things so anyway i would just be curious to hear what you think about that question um i have another sociologist for free if i <laughs> I would say, um, well, with regards to just like words and power, I mean, I, I talked about this a bit with like Foucault, Foucault's whole concept is like words aren't just words. They're tied to systems of power and the way that we um, identify hi hierarchical systems of power. And so um, the reason I would say words work for people who are like heavily funded to manufacture and curate words is tied to those power dynamics. Um, with regards to like infiltration of journalism and this desire of journalists to see objective, there's a great book called Messengers of the Right that, taught, that, I, that I quote in my book and I talk about this, but um, conservative uh, news creators in the 1920s actually reinvented this concept of objective. So objective doesn't mean balance. Uh, you know, objective means um, without bias, but they reframed the conversation to mean objective. So actually, like, how do the words work, right? Yeah. And they reframed this notion of objective to mean balance coverage. And then when there wasn't balance, they used that as an example of why the mainstream media is an extension of the left and is biased and trustworthy. So I think in some response, yes, journalists, or this is what she was saying in her book, um, in some regards, journalists were very worried about that being a problem. So they are constantly like giving voice to both sides to it seems how balanced, but that's not what objective journalism means. And that was actually a disinformation campaign, right? <laughs> Created to uh, legitimize um, right-wing uh, media in the, did I answer your question? Okay. I feel like I don't. I feel like I get excited and then I go off on. Yeah. Oh, well, oh, well, does anyone know that? Oh. Yeah, Rose. Huh? Well, um, I have a lot of like leftist friends who like to argue with conservatives, like on the internet, or they'll talk to Gary the Fifth Preacher. And um, a lot of them say things like, you know, it's not what you say to them, they'll never change their mind. And, you know, this makes sense because they don't care what you're saying, they care about what, like, the original words say, they care about what they Google. But um, and to me, I always think, okay, so just don't talk to them. But you know, as a professional, as a person, I feel like situations might come up. Like, what if I see a family member trying to about these talking points, or what if I have a kid coming to my library and start telling me about um, you know, race theory or whatever? 
that is an effective way to like reach those people and, and try to like show them that they're part of this ecosystem that is harming us all. Yeah. Uh, so, I mean, I don't think anyone likes this idea of feeling exploited. I mean, I think I hopefully what I'm hoping to try to do with this book is to say um, these are very explicit tactics that are drawing on values you care about to spread lies that aren't even necessarily in your interest, right? So we see actually, you know, this exploitation of like the working class um, by politicians that then don't create laws or policies that help working class, they actually hurt um, working class persons. So I think, uh, I mean, I, I, I don't think, um, actually we're seeing this right, I'm actually seeing this right now play out. Um, Stacey Abram talking about how um, ultrasound, the, the sound on ultrasound are like a manufactured sound. And now to have this, um, the right-wing information ecosystem is jumping on this Q&A um, to like, how dare you say that my heartbeat that I heard when I was pregnant wasn't real. And people are responding with it being like, but that's just true, that's the fact, right? But um, I would say, yes, yeah, completely kind of missing the point because family, you know, which is one of the five Fs, this notion of life and, and, and fetal life um, is a major value to conservative groups. So being like, well, like, actually those aren't the facts. Like, let me send you the facts. Like those don't, that's not a rhetorical strategy. I don't think that's like working. Um, but I don't know what the solution is either. I joke about this. And those elements are really good at exposing those problems and not very good at the solution. Um, sorry, I don't know. I'm going to miss it. That's great. Uh, so, uh, you see the media in the second person. They're puzzling over that misinformation exists. He said it as if that is a problem. Um, and, um, you know, in work in libraries and archives, things are all about making sure that things persist so that people in the future can actually learn from our mistakes and then make arguments and prosperity go forward on that. So I'm trying to reconcile the, we don't want it to persist with, yeah, but there's a whole structure of the world to make sure that that institutions persist. So it's probably not the persistence part as much as the flow is talked about. And and um, uh, this notion of do we then try to interrupt flows, they start to become too active. I mean, because I, I, I take your point that you don't want to solve the problem ultimately we don't have to deal with it. And, and so if we're going to, whether it's regulation or ignore ignorance, ignoring things so that you know we don't get infected by um, by wrong things, this is the flow a point that we should be attacking rather than you know throwing people off so they can't be included in what we say. So I would say that okay, that's a great question. I mean, I don't know if we maybe we maybe we need like a disinformation database or something. But like I would say the um, disrupting flow is actually a tactic that journalists are do use and can use, right? So flooding search engines with good information is a way to disrupt these data voids. So researchers at Microsoft came up with this concept of a data void, which is when little to nothing exists online, it becomes easily exploitable by conspiracy theorists trying to spread propaganda. Um, so you can effectively flood with, with, with good information in an effort to drown out the bad information. Um, of course, that's contingent on you know, money and time and all these other things. But that's one strategy that can like disrupt the flow. Um, I would say the other thing is I know search engines are trying to combat this problem. So like, I don't think that, that tech is the only solution, but I think tech has to be part of the solution. Um, 
So like, for example, since a lot of my work has come out, Google shifted, um, they have like a three dot on their um, return. So you can get more information about like, who is the source and why am I getting this return? Um, they are now like uh, highlighting data points. The data voids not only is it when little to nothing exists online, but also this is particularly uh, important during um, news events. So when like a live event is happening, they're really ripe for like this info. And so like as <laughs> the event is unfolding now, when you search for content about the event, Google actually has like a small thing that says, um, this is the current event that's unfolding. I forget the exact language, but this is an event that's unfolding. Check back again. These results might not be the best. I'll check back again. However, okay, Alice and I weren't writing this paper forever, but like there's, they, they're actually using this now to drive people to alternative search engines, right? Like DuckDuckGo. So they, Google is trying to help solve the problem, and now they're like, oh, well, let's just change to a different search engine. So I, I think. Uh, true search, yeah. yeah. I mean, yeah, true social is an interesting one too. You know, um, I don't think it's going to be ever as big as Twitter. I think it'll probably like, <laughs> obviously. Uh, although it's being, a, it's in, it's certainly better than you know, the platform works in that sense. But I think search engines are harder than social media platforms because, like, obviously. A brand new website, a brand new social media app can't like transfer a whole network. But I think search engines, people are more likely to change out their search engine, I would say. Um, or at least we're seeing it. I mean, people are using DuckDuckGo, but also people are using TikTok. Like, a majority of young persons now don't even go to Google, they use TikTok for information because they find it more relevant and they like the format. And in those places, you can go, oh, were we done? I'm sorry, I thought we were uh, Yeah, go ahead, Steve. Yeah, um, it's really great. Uh, I can't wait to dig into the book. Um, my question is about how self-care these uh, right-wing individuals are of the disproportionate power that they have to be able to influence what comes up when somebody runs a search through Google or to or because it strikes me as somewhat ironic when you take, uh, you look at the way that they lambast big tech, right? Well, it's like, oh, big tech is so terrible, and yet this is what's really enabling a lot of their success. And so, obviously, there's you know, one question most of the biting the hand that feeds, but also just, just to what extent are they aware of, you know, how much big tech is helping them, you know, at the same time that they are sort of attacking them as being biased against conservatives, which just seems, I don't know, the rhetoric just seems fundamentally mismatched uh, to the reality that you document. Yeah, I mean, this is what I testified about in 2019. So, I mean, Senator Cruz had a whole hearing for the Judiciary Committee calling, calling out Google censorship. And I was like, and then they had um, Trigger Dennis Rager, who was one of those witnesses, who said, Censored. And I was saying, well, contrary to these anecdotes, um, research demonstrates that that is actually not true, right? In many So I'm not really quite sure what the goal is, except to say um, to increase this notion of uh, the media being biased and the left having an agenda against uh, conservatism, which helps like reinforce this idea. Um, I think it also reinforces this idea that if you search for something and a conservative content creator is not one of the returns, it can very easily make you think that this is all biased and not that, oh, it uh, wasn't uh, quality content or, and in terms of how easy it was, I mean, when I was doing my uh, media immersion and content analysis, I was really struck by the way in which many of these websites would just simply copy and paste content from one to the next and then hyperlink them to one another. And so that's just basic signaling that, that they recognize like, so I don't know for sure 
if they know how these strategies work. But I do know that how the internet works. And I do know that the strategies that they're using are highly conducive to waiting. You go until 4.30? No, we were wrong. Oh, okay. All right. Just, I didn't want to make We had some, I'll call it misinformation. Oh, <laughs> it was not on purpose. It was not on purpose. Yeah. Okay. Do we have anything from the live chat? Don't want to. Okay. After the Dobbs ruling, after decades of like trying to change conversations, I mean, from your perspective, how has it, how has it failed? Like you had Kansas, you had New York 19, you have such a strong reaction to the taking away of reproductive rights. But the right has spent like years trying to build up this ecosystem to drive the conversation. But in this case, it's just it's just smelling so bad they're leaving their own like campaign site. So like how this is different about this, I would say, compared to Yeah, I think that's interesting. I mean, I would say with regards to the abortion debate, I mean, regardless of if this or how this occurred, we still don't really know, right? The 28 the 2022 election was coming up. I mean, we have these examples of Kansas that say um, these were detrimental, but I think when it comes to actually electing officials, I, we still don't know, I don't know how it's going to play out. Um, and I think it definitely has motivated a strong box block of very reliable voters to, to show up. Um, and I think uh, with regards to like, this is not even in my book, but I think <laughs> With, with the way in which uh, social media and search engines are part of this, I think is interesting. So I'm actually doing a research project right now with my RA, and we were looking at um, when people search abortion near me, um, what it's returned. And up until basically three weeks ago, because Google changed it, which is great. I mean, good that Google's making information more accurate. But up until a few weeks ago, the top returns were not abortion providers. Um, they were primary care providers that are um, very conservative organizations that advocate not for So, um, and in advertising, um, those are still the top returns. So, when you, top returns, when you search abortion near me, they have now changed their map to have a toggle where you can write offers abortion, not offers abortion, and they tag their content to say <laughs> offers abortion, not offers abortion, but the advertising is still the top return are clinics that do not offer abortion. The crisis. The crisis pregnancy centers, yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, sorry, I said PCC. <laughs> PCC, <laughs> the crisis pregnancy centers, yeah. So those are your top returns. Um, so I would say, I think it's still pretty, in terms of understanding how search engines look. Whether, we don't know what's going to happen in this election. Um, no. I'm just thinking now that the Republicans are literally deleting our uh, websites and then the guy in New York 19 got bounced and he was moderate, but people are so alert. The Democrats got outspent, but people are so allergic to like uh, anti abortion message that they just, they simply refuse and I guess talk about information asymmetry. What about the cases where it just fails or like backfires? No, go ahead. Yeah. So I, I don't know how much this needs to convince everyone. Yeah. Right? Oftentimes you just need like a strong cadre of folks willing to like invest themselves and create some political hey, right? Like if you think about January 6th, like they took over Congress with like not that many folks, right? Mm -hmm. Right. And so like what I think about this, I don't I mean, it, it, no, no, it just, I don't always think about this in terms of like a mass. I think about it in terms of like only guns, right? Or so like the amount of like sort of carnage and chaos that some really devoted folks who, you know, the pizza gate, that like I, I have a line in my book about pizza gate, right? You had folks like with their AK 47 walking up into kids' parties because of misinformation, right? And so I think on the one hand, 
Yeah, we can think about it in terms of mass movements or complex. Also, on my share amount of time, uh, and I would say for every state where you see it backfiring, there are states outlawing. Yeah. And so, I actually have a question from Dr. Estran. Oh, just great. Emailed me one. So, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, she said, great talk, by the way, which is finally saved. So, um, but she. <laughs> Um, she wanted me to ask if you could talk more about your method, um, specifically like the challenges, how you manage like the sheer scope and size of your data collection, um, in particular, because she's interested in multi-method approaches and the challenges that come with them. Um, she wants to know, is this unique in terms of studying disinformation or within your field? And specifically, she's asking if she would like to kind of learn about this to apply within legal media, a law and society approaches. Yeah, so I would say, I don't think, I mean, I definitely am doing ethnography is not unique and combining ethnography with um, quantitative data sets, I don't think is, is particularly unique. It's kind of my flair, I guess. I like to combine qualitative data with quantitative data um, that I don't know how to scrape myself. So I have to regularly partner with people who can do that. I would say the um, challenges of qualitative data collection or ethnography are time and finances. Um, I was extremely fortunate to be a postdoc at Data and Society for this research project. This research project would not have been possible without that institutional support that provided um, the, the time and money to conduct what I thought to be very rich qualitative work. Um, and I think any qualitative study has like, the pitfalls of what do you do with all this data afterwards? It's exhausting. I mean, you have like all these field notes, all these interviews. You're tired. You've been like talking to all these people. Um, so I think that just kind of goes with the that goes with it. I use I rely on grounded theory um, because I find it to be a very method that works very well for me, where I go through my data. I do what's called in vivo coding. We have like very specific code within the data themselves. I create sets of what are called analytical categories or analytical memos based on my conceptual categories. And then and then I connect the dots to the actual process. And that's what works for me. Um, quantitatively, I think that's something we're talking about. Actually, I held this like mini conference for digital sociologists last week. We were talking about the challenges of big data sets. So you think, I think me as a qualitative data person, I was like, oh, if I could like scrape the data, it'll be like so easy because then I'll just have all this great finding <laughs> and they'll just like shoot out at me like all these answers that, I'll, that I would have never seen <laughs> through quality data. And then I, I mean, it's essentially this like massive CSV file, like which is this Excel spreadsheet that you have to clean up and then like interpret and make sense of it. It took a lot of time too. So I'd say there's no easy way. Um, I don't know if that's a question. I'm sure. I just to follow up on that, like I'd just be curious to hear more about like the media immersion side of things sure. as well. Um, you know, over in like so, the part of Com, we would just yeah. have count all those things. You know what I mean? Like yeah. no, no, we yeah. Like, count through that media, and we would like try to understand yeah. what's going on there. So like, I just I want to hear about the immersion part of it. Sure. Yeah. So the immersion part of it, I, I, I would say I'm a media sociologist, and there's a lot of sociology on ethnography, and I don't think very much ethnography of media. Mm -hmm. And so I actually kind of invented this concept of media immersion as okay, a part of the ethnographic process. Okay, it's, a, it's a Tripodi original. So like, <laughs> there was like oh, all this ethnography, right? And I'm like, but what are they, what are they doing? Like after I leave them. What are they watching and listening to? And like, how does that matter and shape their belief systems in ways that I can't glean from talking to them? And so by able, one, I don't have a normal Facebook account. So it enabled me to have a research Facebook account. And I think the way that's not possible if you're trying to protect the confidentiality of people, like you can get a separate Facebook account just for that. Um, and following and like seeing the stories they were sharing. And I was like, oh, what is this story? 
then I was like, okay, this is not enough. I need to just kind of go all in. So I deleted all my apps. I downloaded all these different podcasts. I was up every morning watching Fox and Friends. I, that's how I started my day, right? Like I had my coffee and I had a young baby. So I was up early. And I was like, let's turn on Fox and Friends and see what's going on for today. And then I had a set of notes where I was analyzing like what is the common thread happening, but also what is the advertising being sent to me? How does that kind of shape this persona? Um, who is this person that's like writing this stuff? And then I got to get like a bunch of what was also fascinating is I could see through Facebook. Facebook sent me a bunch of ads and suggested content based on this person. So I also got to see like what do they sell to conservatives and how does this align um, with political advertising, right? And your uh, stuff as well. But the media immersion was like, uh, I mean, I went very deep. Process and like I was listening to these podcasts on my way to and from work, and the story I talk about it in my book at the beginning. But I was like, during the um, I'm forgetting it, the major, the mural, the not mural, the Mueller investigation. Yeah. And remember how they like had these breadcrumbs? They were like, wow, be indicted, <laughs> but they weren't telling us who it was, and it was like, be indicted. And I got out of the shower and. I'm like, my husband was like, Ryan, do you think Hillary Clinton is going to be? And I was so, I was like, but what if she, you know, like all those emails and like, she, maybe she, I mean, I voted for her. What if she ends up being indicted? And he's like, I, this was one of the conversations. Like, you know, Jess, I can't really respond to this. I don't know what to tell you today. Like, please don't watch my Yeah, he was like, yeah, he's like, holy oh, yeah, cat, I'm gonna wrap it up. Resaturation. Resaturation. <laughs> <laughs> See, yeah, yeah, sweet resaturation. Yeah. Um, and then when it was when it was Manafort, I was like, oh my gosh. Like that was that point where I was like, wow, I have I have lost touch with a reality that I have known my whole life. Uh, and so, yeah, then we wrap up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, as you know, I love this project. I've been lucky enough to see it through its various. Yes, Alice was the Adidas Data Society when yeah. I saw it back in the day. Um, and what you just said, I feel like I love the anecdote about you being in the shower. And you're like, oh, it's Clinton that's going to be in there. I mean, Petrified. And I wonder, you you were scared for her. I was like very scared that it was legitimately her. Like, I was like, oh my gosh, what is going to happen when it's her? That, yeah, that yeah. So I was thinking when you were you were uh, you were speaking, I was thinking about like the computer warp hypothesis, right? The idea that like you see the world through like the concepts by which we view the world are shaped by the light. And and I was thinking also about the relationship between epistemology and media. And I was wondering, like, having had this experience, not just being a scholar of media, but also having someone who's basically used a technology ended up getting altered by the media that you were consuming. Like, what if, I don't know, what insights do you have, I guess, about that larger point based on this experience? Well, I would say, one, because I was so embedded in that environment is how I understood how search engines were being gained. Yeah. So I would say up and until if I hadn't changed my epistemological framework, I never would have Googled NFL ratings are not enough, right? Because it was during this project that Trump was saying NFL ratings are way down. And when you searched NFL ratings were down, you got nothing but information about his claims that NFL ratings were down because of Colin Kaepernick's protest with Black Lives Matter. And then I was like, okay, maybe they're not, you know, like, let me just make sure, like what's happening. And then I said that, and then it was like an entirely different set of search returns. Some of it, Sports Illustrated on both sets of returns, confirming this completely alternative reality to the one that I had been embedded in. So I would say it was because of that, like, I don't think I would have been able to know that Nellie Orr was a 
in a void if I had not been so heavily seeped in that system. Um, so yeah, I mean, I think that's really what helped me like drive this whole the, this whole concept of the way that the way we see the world drives these keywords from the offset, and it can effectively create a parallel <laughs> internet in which you're currently living. So I think a lot of the algorithmic polarization that we're dealing with right now has less to do with the filter bubble being manufactured by some, you know, tool. Uh, I think it's part of it. I mean, we do know that they want to keep us on these platforms because they're not possible. But I think also people are much more inclined to like search for information from the beginning that reconfirms their system as the police. I don't know if that much is I feel like you should wrap it up. That was a great question. Oh, actually, I don't know. Is there one last one? Oh, good. Oh, sorry. Where, did my, where did my research kind of go from here? Where did my research go from here? Um, that's a horrible question. I'm just kidding. That's a great question. I um, I am right now doing research on this very concept. So, how do people's biases shape their keywords? And I ask persons inside of libraries. Um, because we wanted to look at public libraries, oftentimes people will say, like, well, it's just because it's heavily personalized. That's why they're getting those returns that they are. But um, Google says that they aren't that, and so I'm trying to test this concept. And so we go inside public libraries and we ask people very, very polarizing questions about a set of prompts to do with like things like abortion and gun control and um, immigration. And then we ask for people to search for more information on the topic. And then I'm capturing this through um, a recorded device. So I have, their la I have a laptop that's on loan. They're doing these queries through this laptop. And then out of that, we're finding, um, yes, I see it's very much shape returns. So um, with like the abortion one, people are searching for like abortion near me or like where do I terminate this pregnancy? Is there pro uh, abortion? Is there supporting abortion? If they, are um, not for abortion, they search for things like what's an alternative to abortion or like adoption services in the area. Um, but I'm also finding that uh, people do most of their searching online, um, excuse me, um, remotely, but through mobile. That this concept of like a um, laptop search environment is actually very antiquated. Um, people are using the microphone to talk their query. And uh, so, so I'm trying to get a grant that can provide me with software to look actually more on mobile search on the role. I think. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs>